Hello, everybody. It'll take me a second to get organized. Thank you for showing up tonight. I do appreciate it. Um, the good news is I'm the opening act for Debbie Ross. So <laughs> Debbie will be out in a very short time. Um, that was a nice introduction. My name is Dave Jones. I'm director of the Illinois State Archives, and I've written my first book. And they wouldn't give me, let me have the title of it that I wanted, which is, hey, Mom, I wrote a book. Um, so I went with From Slave to State Legislator, and it is a biography of John W. E. Thomas, who was the first African American in the state legislature. Um, and I met him, he's been dead since 1899, but I first met him or became aware of him some 14 years ago. So it's been a long process for me, but as Eileen mentioned, um, it's been a very, very good one. Um, the way I got involved with this, I was the press secretary for the Illinois Senate Black Caucus. And if you go to the Capitol, over in, um, well, here in Springfield, if you go to the Capitol, you'll see a statue for a guy named Adelbert Roberts. He was the first African American in the Illinois Senate. And every year for Black History Month, I would do these articles and these columns for my African American senators on black history. And we'd always focus on Illinois. You know, these are short columns. We're not going to be writing about Martin Luther King Jr. or Jackie Robinson. We don't, we're not going to have a lot to add to that. But we'd write about famous Illinois African Americans. Daniel Hale Williams, for example, who performed the first open heart surgery, or Ida B. Wells. Um, and I'd always tag on, and don't forget, Albert Roberts. He was the first African American in the state Senate. Well... When I left the Senate, I went to University of Illinois at Springfield, and I had a newsletter as a contract. And anybody who's worked um, for a university knows how important contracts are. <clears throat> and it was a monthly newsletter, and about seven or eight of the uh, issues would be about the legislature, and then three or four I got to have some fun with and do history type stuff. And they said, well, can you do something for Black History Month? They said this, I think it was 1998. Um, and I said, sure, that's what I used to do when I was press secretary for the Black Caucus. And I thought I'd just recycle one of my old columns. Um, but they wanted something a little bit more. Um, they wanted a little bit longer. And so um, I had to do a little more research. And that's when I discovered that, yes, Senator Roberts was the first African American in the Senate, elected in 1924, but he wasn't even close to being the first African American in the General Assembly. In fact, John W. E. Thomas, who I had never heard of, was elected in 1876 and served three terms. And then there were 11 more African Americans in the House before we elected someone in the Senate. So I was um, a little embarrassed by this. I've never gone back to the old columns I used to write for the caucus to see how badly I made a mistake or how badly I misinformed the public. But I was a little embarrassed by this. So I wrote a whole newsletter on just on John W. E. Thomas. I used mostly secondary sources um, because there wasn't a lot out there. And by the time I finished with that newsletter, I was a little more interested in this guy who no one had done anything on. Just a couple of mentions here and a couple of mentions there. So at the time, I was getting a master's degree and taking a class called Doing Local History with a woman named Deb McGregor. I see uh, Denise over there, so you know Deb, of course. Um, and I needed a topic because we had a 25-page paper that was due, and I thought, well, this is perfect. I'll write a whole biography of this guy in 25 pages. Well, by the end of the semester, I had a 25-page paper. Now, Thomas was born in 1847. Um, his peak years were the 1880s. This biography that I was going to write um, again, in large part because I was embarrassed, went up to 1878. He'd been elected, and he'd been defeated. That was as far as I got. Um, so many years, two more terms in office, a bunch of elections, all kinds of stuff happened that didn't make the biography, but that was okay because I was getting a master's degree, and I needed a topic for my thesis. So it's like, okay, this will be great. You know, I'm not so embarrassed anymore. I'm really actually starting to get interested in this guy. This guy's kind of interesting. Um, it wasn't that he was just the first person. Uh, he, he did some kind of interesting things. So it's like, we'll do a biography for the thesis. Well, two years go by. The thesis is done. And I got up from 1878 to 1882. I only added four years. I missed two more terms in office. I missed a whole bunch of elections. There was a lot more stuff out there. And at this point, I was, and it was a 70, 75-page thesis. Well, at this point, um, I was thinking, that's OK. Because this guy, I'm not embarrassed anymore that I didn't know who he was. I'm not even just curious about who he was. I'm really interested in who John W. E. Thomas is or was. Um, fascinated. Um, the stuff I'd uncovered that had never been known about him, the person that he was, and I decided at that point, and this is 2000, this guy deserves a book. And I go, and I am absolutely not the guy to do it. But <clears throat> um, I thought, nobody else is going to do it. The man's been dead for 101 years at this point. So I decided to get a dissertation and do a dissertation on him and then maybe turn that into a book. And that's what I did. And um, the more I wrote about him, the more I researched him, the more I decided this guy 
um, was the real deal. He was worthy of a book. And that was, as I went through this process, that's the one question I continually asked myself, and that's the question tonight that I want you to ask yourselves as I go through this. Was he worthy of a book? Sometimes being the first person um, is just happenstance. It's luck of the draw. I am, for example, the first Swiss American to be the director of the Illinois State Archives. I know it's shocking, you know, but no one's going to no one's gonna write a book about me. Just luck of the draw. My mom's very proud of that, but that's okay. Um, but just being the first African American in the, in the house, maybe it was luck, but as my research went on, no, it was more than luck. He did a lot of things. He was the leader of his community for 20 years. It's a very small community. In this book, you'll learn about John Thomas himself, the struggles he went through, what he was like as a person, but you're also gonna learn about the community because not a lot has been reported on the community. And if I remember, and feel free to ask at the end of this, um, because I'm going to talk about Thomas in a minute. First, of course, I want to talk about myself. But don't let me forget to mention some of the people in the community, because these people have been forgotten a lot by history, too, and there's some fascinating people. Some of the elites in the community, they remind me, frankly, of the founding fathers, the arguments they had. These are the guys who are setting the foundation for the African-American community in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois, and yet they've been forgotten. And they, they were real people with real issues, real disagreements, and in some cases, absolutely unbelievable personalities, and that's all in the book. So, with that, with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about Thomas himself. Again, remember the question, is he worthy of a book? So, Thomas was born a slave in Alabama um, in 1847, give or take. He was owned by a Dr. McCleskey, who was a physician, so Thomas worked out of the house. Um, his father was a free black who eventually moved to Chicago during the Civil War, a little bit before the Civil War, and his mother was a slave. Now, Dr. McCleskey provided Thomas with a good education, and you never want to say someone's liberal, but he allowed Thomas to teach other African-American slaves, I presume. He allowed him to teach them um, and give them the basics of education. But Thomas ran errands for him, um, collected debts for him, even went on house calls for him. So Thomas received a pretty decent education, and he always had... Um, a strong learning for life, and he always had a desire to help others, by, mostly by teaching. In 1864, he married a woman named Maria Reynolds. They had one daughter, Hester. She was born, they moved to South Carolina for a while, then they moved to Chicago in 1869. Um, in Chicago, he opened up the uh, school for African Americans. The newspaper said it was the first school in the history of the city that was for African Americans. He opened up a grocery out of his house. They lived on the near south side of Chicago. Um, if you know where Dearborn Station is, um, basically that would have been across the street for him in the later years, and then they would have bought his house and torn it down um, for development of more of the station. So that was his neighborhood right there. There's a park back there um, behind Dearborn Station that someday I'd like to see a plaque because that would have been right across the street from the Thomas home. Someday I'd like to see a plaque put up there um, commemorating Thomas. Okay, so he's a very smart young man. He's very young when he's in Chicago. He uh, opens up the school, opens up a grocery. He goes to business school, um, gets involved in fraternal organizations, African-American organizations, gets involved with Olivet Baptist Church, which was the leading black church in uh, Chicago at the time, and also gets involved in local politics. Now, in the post-Civil War era, well into the Depression, um, African-Americans were overwhelmingly Republican. This is the party of Lincoln, the party that freed the slaves. Um, so he was a rock-solid Republican, and one of the hallmarks of his career was his loyalty to the Republican Party. Um, so he gets involved in politics. In 1870, African-Americans got the right to vote. In 1871, John Jones is elected to the county board, the first African-American elected to any office in the state. He's re-elected in 1872 and defeated in 1875. So we go into 1876. There's not one African-American elected to any office in Chicago, Cook County, or the state of Illinois. And the community is very small. It's never more than 2% of the population at this time. The African-American community doesn't grow until the Great Migration of the 1910s and 1920s, but it's very unified, something Thomas believed they had to be unified to have any success, and it's a very unified community and very loyal to the party. So they want an elected office. Um, they feel they've deserved it, they've been loyal to the party. They want the state representative position, and they unite behind John Thomas. This is our guy for state representative. So Thomas goes to the convention. They had, and I love politics back then. The convention was like October 16th with the election three weeks away. If we only had that now. 
Um, <clears throat> So he goes to the convention, he's got a unified, there's three wards and a couple of townships in his district, he's got a unified second ward behind him, that's the ward that had the most African Americans in it, although 10% of the population maybe at the time. Um, and he, on the third ballot, is nominated. They actually nominated two candidates back then, there were actually three seats up, it was under cumulative voting. So he gets nominated for, uh, for the position. Now one of the questions, again, is he worthy of a book? One of the questions you would ask is, was it a big deal at the time? Okay, um, and in this case it was. Everybody knew they were nominating the first African American for the Illinois legislature, and, and they treated it thusly. Um, the Democrat newspapers, they didn't come out and, they were racist, they didn't come out and be blatantly racist, but they called him the Ethiopian. They called him a whitewasher. They said uh, he was nominated only because he was black. Um, but they said it wasn't based on race. The, the Republican papers were very friendly toward him. They, they knew the significance of the event. Again, he's a Republican. Um, but he was never listed when he ran for office or when he was in office. It was always John W. E. Thomas colored or John W. E. Thomas Negro or John W. E. Thomas black. It was never just John W. E. Thomas R2, which would have been his district number. So he was always made aware, even by his friends, that he was different. As a historian, sometimes, frankly, that helped me because when he was in the legislature and he would do something because he was always the first African American to do it, they'd comment on it in the newspaper so I'd have a source. If I was doing something on a Swiss legislator or a German, it wouldn't be there. On the fr when he was a freshman in the legislature, almost half the legislature was freshmen, but it was when Thomas spoke on the, for the first time on the floor that there was an article commenting upon it. Um, so as a historian, that worked out well but I'm kind of glad I wasn't in his shoes at the time. Okay, so he gets the nomination for the second district, 1876. He is gonna win the election, probably. Um, it's a Republican district, there's two Republican candidates, one Democrat, he's probably gonna win the election, but he is the first African American running. In his district, you have the most African Americans in the city, but it's a small percentage, but it helps. The rest of the district is divided pretty evenly between Democrats and Republicans, except for along the lakefront. And on the south side back then, in, in Chicago they talk about the North Shore and that's where the wealthy people live. Back then it was on the south side, around 18th Street, and that was in the district. That was overwhelmingly Republican. So he should have no troubles winning. But the wealthy people along the, district, along the lakefront didn't like Thomas, okay? So again, is he worthy of a book? Well, here's the st first story I'm gonna tell about that. Um, so they weren't big fans of Thomas. They had an uh, organization called the Municipal Reform League. Okay, this is the do-gooders. These are the, the, the best of the city. And how do you know they're the best? Well, just ask them and they'll tell you that they're the best. <clears throat> but they were the ones, they didn't get involved in politics until election time, and then they said, you should vote for this, 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 and this. And usually Republicans, because they were the wealthy and they were a little more conservative. Um, but they didn't do a lot of work. Well, they didn't want to endorse Thomas. Okay, there was two or three candidates during that election cycle. They were not gonna endorse John Thomas. Um, it's historically significant to my mind because one of their leading members was a guy named Robert Todd Lincoln. And here we are in his father's building. Um, and Robert Todd Lincoln was very outspoken opposing John Thomas. Um, and he said, of course, well, he's too young, even though Thomas wasn't the youngest candidate out there. He's too inexperienced as opposed to anybody running for the legislature the first time. Um, the newspapers, the Republican newspapers of the time were adamant in calling Robert Todd Lincoln and the other members of the Municipal Reform League, calling him racist, saying, no, the reason you are opposed to this man is because his skin is black. Well, things, Thomas needed this endorsement. This was a powerful Republican group, or at least people thought he did. So the League calls Thomas to their clubhouse. Again, these are the elites. This is an endorsement he needs. They call him to his clubhouse and they say, and they want to ask him, who are you, how are you gonna vote on these issues? In other words, if you vote the way we tell you to vote, you'll get our endorsement. Um, <clears throat> so Thomas sent them a note saying, my place of business is at 198 South 4th Street, and if you want, you can come over and see me and we'll talk. So as one of the newspapers said, the members of the, of the Municipal Reform League lifted up their noses to Thomas, and he promptly lifted up his own proboscis to them. And he, didn't, he did not get their endorsement, they wound up not endorsing, and he won the election. So at the age of 30, he became the first African American in the Illinois General Assembly, actually 29, and he stood up to the Municipal Reform League. So there's a little bit of a story back there. Um, in the legislature, there's a whole great chapter in the book, and I, I think I'm supposed to encourage you to buy the book, but there's a whole 
um, chapter on his first term, which he served three terms in the legislature. Um, and the first one and the third one, I think, are the two most interesting. And in the first term, I won't go into great detail, but there's a couple of stories about the racism that he did face. Um, the first one was, he was, and we still do this today, uh, the chairman left the podium, the speaker left the podium, and actually asked Thomas if he would run the meeting, if he'd serve as the speaker, as the chairman. Um, it, it's still done today. It was the first time, by the way, an African-American ever served as Speaker of the House. Everything he did in the House was the first time, and he did a good job. The newspapers of the day, the, the Republican and the Democrat papers, um, all said he did a good job. And I always, the papers back then were very partisan. That's why I like to get both sides. Um, and that's why I spent so much time here across the street at the library in the newspaper section, going through five, six, seven papers at a time for a story. So they said he did a fine time, but Illinois, back then was kind of a southern state. It was settled from the, by southerners from the south to the north. And a number of, of um, southern Democrats congregated in the back of the chamber and started very loudly voicing their indignation that there was a black man at the front. You know, it's one thing to elect and serve with a African American. I mean, those crazy Chicagoans, they can do what they want. They're a bunch of crazy liberals anyway. But to actually be, you know, have someone chairman, have an African American chairman was too much for him. And it forced the speaker to come back early to, uh, to take over the chair to quiet them down. So that was one example that he had to face when he was here. Another example, of course, was every time he's mentioned in the newspapers, again, even by his friends, it's the, the black legislator, the, the, the colored legislator. Another example that he saw was, um, and we still do this today too, every day for session it's open with a prayer. They invite a local minister to give the prayer. Um, one day, and they had two African Americans who did it, Reverend Coleman from Union Baptist Church, which is still here, and then Reverend Brents, who was from uh, the AME church. And Reverend Brents was giving the, the opening prayer and he finished. And a delegate uh, representative from Southern Illinois introduced a resolution saying, we don't want any more blacks giving, um, giving the opening prayer. Um, that's the kind of environment Thomas was in. One of the newspapers very correctly said that Connolly, and that was the name of the, uh, the state representative, he was your traditional Democrat who would rather go to hell than be prayed for by an African American. So, uh, so, so those are the kind of things Thomas battled as um, a candidate and as a, a state senator. And those are the kind of things that, again, the stories that I don't think should be forgotten and the kind of things I wanted to see in this book. Um, 1878, he's not renominated. Um, political reasons, it's not based on race per se. Back then, incumbency wasn't as powerful a thing as it is now, so he wasn't renominated in 1878. Was not, he, he tried for the legislature again in 1880, wasn't renominated. In the meantime, his first wife passed away in 1878. Uh, he married again in 1880. Uh, he passed the bar, became the seventh or eighth African American attorney in the state of Illinois. Uh, he was never a leading light in the legal community, but it provided him with a very good income, a very good living. <clears throat> After losing the nomination in 1880, he moved to Washington, D.C. for a year, and he worked for the Treasury Department. He came back in 1882, and he was elected, nominated again, and elected to a second term. Uh, sometimes I'll call it re-elected, but again, there had been two terms where he wasn't in the legislature, and those were the last two terms where we didn't have any African American in the legislature, 1879 and 1881. So he's re-elected in 1882. But the community has changed a little bit. So he believed that the community needed to be united to be successful, and I think that's a, a correct, because it was so small. But it's beginning to, to divide in the 1880s. So to win the nomination, he had to defeat three other African Americans, which he did. But the community is starting to unravel. And you really begin to see this in 1883 and 1885 with what's called colored conventions. And these are conventions called by leading African Americans to discuss the issues of the day to the community, things like uh, better training for African-American teachers, you know, schools that are not segregated, um, jobs within unions for, again, for African-Americans, those kind of issues. Well, they also were discussing loyalty to the Republican Party, and Thomas was almost always a loyal Republican. But during the 1880s, the Republican Party seemed like it was forgetting the solid base of votes, the African-Americans. They didn't get the patronage, they didn't get the jobs. Down south, the Republicans were dealing with the Democrats rather than black Republicans. Um, so there was a movement to kind of leave or become more independent from the Republican Party, to kind of sell your vote. For example, in Chicago, if you were gonna run a ticket, the Democrats would have a German on the ticket and the Republicans would have a German on the ticket in a bid for the German vote. And African-Americans, some of them at the time were wanting to do that same thing. Well, if we you know, sell ourselves to the highest bidder like the other ethnic groups, right now the Democrats ignore us and the Republicans take us for granted. This way they'll have to bid for us. 
a very logical, sound argument, but one that Thomas would have disagreed with, saying we're too small for that. We cannot be divided. And my own thoughts, either argument's fine. My own thoughts are, I think Thomas was right, a small community is the way to go. But by 1883, the community's breaking up, <coughs> and they have these conventions. And here's where uh, um, it costs Thomas. His loyalty to the Republican Party costs Thomas. The mugwumps, the anti-Republicans, called the convention. Thomas attended as a delegate in 1883 um, and gets elected chairman. He was, everybody knew who he was. The mugwumps didn't like him, but the downstaters loved him. He considered him they considered him their rep. Um, so he gets elected chairman. And the first day, it's a two-day convention held over in the uh, state capitol here in Springfield, 50 delegates. It's a two-day convention. And at the first day, Thomas has taken over the convention. It's going to be loyal for the Republicans. And this was a big deal. They were not going to embarrass the Republican Party. That was the good news. The bad news is that night, the Supreme Court decision outlawing the Federal Civil Rights Act came down. In other words, the all-Republican, nine-member U.S. Supreme Court said the Civil Rights Act, with the, which the African-American community loved, um, and needed was unconstitutional. And African Americans, including Thomas, felt like they'd been stabbed in the back. It was a Republican court that outlawed this. And all the court said, actually, was um, the federal government can't do it. You need to do it at the state level. That's what they said. But the outrage was incredible. And Thomas had a convention to run the second day, trying not to embarrass the Republican Party. Well, uh, the whole day was just one big slam at the Republican Party. And right at the end, they were going to pass a resolution very, very critical of the Republican Party. And Thomas, the party loyalist, didn't want that. Um, so they called it for a vote. There's 50 delegates, and he's the chairman. And here's one where, again, he's a, he's a good politician and a good legislator and a good, uh, uh, he knows how to run a, run a meeting. Um, so they call a, he calls a voice vote. Everybody stand up for this. Everybody stand up for this. And lo and behold, the resolution which he opposed was defeated. Now, the newspapers of the day, and I'll say it again, the Republican papers and the Democrat papers both said by their nose count the resolution passed. Um, and people in the chamber, of course, especially those for the resolution, um, thought it passed too. And they made a motion to call for a roll call. He, ca he ruled the motion out of order. They made a motion to do a revote. He ruled it out of order. And then he adjourned the meeting. So it was a big victory for him. Very loyal to the party, but it cost him. Next year, 1884, he seeks to become the first African-American to serve as a delegate, full delegate, to a major party convention, the Republican Party. And the nomination is his. They had a slate of candidates who were going to serve as delegate, and somebody sat up and said, we think there should be an African-American. Um, and the delegates thought about it and debated it, and they were like, you know, you're probably right, and we want Thomas. Again, the community was united, and we want John Thomas. And it looked like it was going to happen. And at that point, just as it was going to happen, one of the African-American delegates, um, Charles Spencer Smith out of Bloomington, who by this time was a bitter enemy of Thomas, he'd been at the, he was a mugwump, he shouldn't have even really been at this convention, um, stood up and said, you know what, you guys had a slate of candidates, we came in at the last minute, our bad, our fault, we shouldn't have done it this way, you guys vote for your slate and maybe next time we'll get a delegate. And that's all the white delegates needed. They had a split in the community. They could sit there and say, you know what? You guys can't even decide who you want, so we're going to vote for the slate. And Thomas lost. So his actions at the 1883 convention, where he was trying to keep the community united, um, wound up hurting him. OK. Still, he was elected, re-elected in 1884 to his third and final term in the legislature. Um, again, the community is a little bit more divided, but by this point, um, uh, the seat itself was considered it was going to go to an African-American, and he was still the most powerful African-American at the time. So he's elected, 1884, goes to the legislature in 1885. And in 1885, he has his legislative legacy. This is the first session since the federal civil rights bill was outlawed, was ruled unconstitutional, and he passes a civil rights bill. Okay, so this is a big deal. This is actually the only bill he passes in his three terms in the legislature. Um, and it's a big bill. It's the first civil rights act in the, city, in the uh, state of Illinois. So he gets it passed, and he handled it. I, I put it in the book. He handled it like a pro, the way he, he sent it to his committee. He got the right sponsors in the Senate. He did very well with it. Um, <clears throat> so he passes that. And you would think that the community would just, oh, this is my guy again. Hey, he passed the Civil Rights Act. No, the community is still divided. We have another colored convention in 1885 called, again, by people who oppose the Republican Party. By this point, you have a Democrat in the White House. You have a Democrat as the mayor of the city of Chicago. And again, it's very split. Um, Thomas, again, though, is elected chairman. And once again, he rules with kind of a heavy hand. And he keeps the convention loyal to the party. Okay, And his reward for that in 1886, 
you know, he angered the African American community, a good chunk of it, and the white Republicans didn't care. And in 1886, he loses his bid for renomination to the legislature. And then, and he never served in the legislature again. Um, but he had accomplished the Civil Rights Act. So again, I think worthy of a book. After that, um, he was elected Southtown clerk, a township position for one term. He, his second wife had passed away in his second term in the legislature. Um, she had always been sickly. She was pregnant. He brought her down here. Um, she gave birth to a sickly child. He sent her to Jacksonville to the hospital there. She passed away there, and then a couple weeks later, the, the child died. Um, so he had a very tough second session in 1883. Um, in 1887, he remarried a woman named Critty Marshall. They had six children, four of whom lived to be adults. And he did have the habit of, with his successive wives, they tended to be younger and younger. So she was actually very young. So she lived until 1947. Uh, in 1888, he tried for the county board nomination. One of the things Thomas did was there was a, Chicago was not the racist, segregated city that it would later become, you know, during the Great Migration and the race riots. Um, but there was only so far African Americans could go. And my interest has always been in the political world. Uh, we had had one African American on the county board, and that was really in response to the Chicago fire. It had nothing to do with his race, especially. So in 18, and then of course Thomas in the General Assembly. And when he wasn't renominated, he was replaced by an African American, by the way. And ever since, we've had at least one African American in the General Assembly from that district. Um, so in 1888, he tries for the county board. And this is one where you see some real integrity on the, on the part of Thomas. And again, in my mind, worthy of a book. This guy who 15 years ago I'd never heard of, and I'm guessing a year ago most people here hadn't heard of. But he shows some real integrity. And it stems around a case about a young African American named Zephyr Davis. Zephyr Davis, 21, 22, worked at a factory where he was a supervisor over some whites and a lot of immigrants. I don't know what happened, but he did one day, he killed Maggie Gone, an Irish girl. Killed her and he fled to Kankakee where he was caught and brought back. Okay, and, there's, and no one doubts that he did the murder and he was eventually hung for it. Uh, one of those things. But he was brought back and they convened a coroner's jury, the coroner's office had a jury where they have to sit there for people who die, I don't know if they still do this or not, say the cause of death, and if they think there was anything criminal, if there was criminal intent in that cause of death. So the coroner's jury got together and said, yes, she's dead, this is how she died, and we believe she was murdered, and we believe Zephyr Davis did it. And they could have stopped there, but the deputy coroner, a guy named William Kent, um, decided to go a little farther, and he had the, the jury, and then he himself did it, also sit there and say, and one of the causes for this murder was the fact that you have whites and blacks working together, and my God, you even have blacks in a supervisor role. This was a factor in her getting killed. Okay, um, well, the black community could not tolerate that. The coroner is a Republican, and the most popular Republican in the city at the time, certainly the most popular vote-getter, but they could not tolerate that. So they go to the coroner's office, and I don't know if Thomas was a part of the group or not. Uh, you, when you rely on papers, you live and die on it, and there's not a lot of sources for... African-American history back then, so you have to rely on the paper. So I don't know if Thomas was a part of it or not, but they went to Hertz, the Republican coroner, and these are all Republicans. They said, we want this guy fired. That is inexcusable. Um, Henry Hertz, the coroner, called in Kent and basically backed him up, and he said, I gotta go with my guy. Well, the community was outraged, just absolutely outraged, and this is 1888. They would not forgive Hertz if they ever really did till about 1896. Whenever anything was associated with Henry Hertz, um, the African American community would just not be a part of it. All right, so getting back to the convention for and where Thomas is seeking county board. So you get to the convention, there's roughly, ele it's county convention, there's roughly 11 African American delegates, Thomas is one of them, and the Republican Party renominate, they have a whole slate. This is going to be the ticket. And the Hertz nomination comes up. And the, Black caucus there, the black uh, delegates say no. They, they run another candidate. Hertz creams them. Someone tries to make the nomination uh, unanimous, and they say no. Um, we, will, we refuse, and it's, it's a very bitter convention at this point. Uh, what, what had been a, just an easy convention up until that point um, got very bitter at that point because of their anger, it hurts. Okay, that's fine. Well, the community had united behind John Thomas for county board, and those county board nominations are coming up. There's a slate of 10 candidates. It comes up, someone um, says, well, we don't like this 10th candidate. He was actually a Democrat. Um, but we don't want this candidate, and we nominate John Thomas. 
Okay, a Hertz ally seconds the motion to nominate Thomas, and then he sends, Hertz sends a couple people over to the black delegates to say, basically he's worried about ha not having black support. So they say, okay, we'll support Thomas for county board, but we need you guys to commit to, to the Hertz candidacy, and they wouldn't do it. And so Thomas lost the nomination because he would not, he would not accede unless Kent was fired, and he would not accede because of the actions of Henry Hertz. And that, for someone who likes, who enjoys running for office and uh, who is a politician by nature, that was a sign of integrity that the community didn't forget. And there had been some splits in the community before and all of, all of the African-American delegates there. But after that, I think any damages he had were repaired because again, he turned down a sure nomination. He turned down overtures from the most popular politician in Chicago just because of uh, the Zephyr Davis case. So he, was, he had a lot of integrity. A um, couple other, just a couple of quick things. In 1890, they had what's called, and I'm sure it's on this, uh, he tried for state senate and he lost, not because of race, that was a, that was a political thing, bad alliances. Um, there would not be an African American, this is 1890, elected to the senate for 34 years. Again, he's always pushing at that glass ceiling that was always present. Um, but he also founded or attended as a delegate the Afro-American League, which was kind of a league that was before the Urban League and the NAACP. It was a, it was a big event. It was a national organization founded by T. Thomas Fortune, again, to deal with African-American issues um, at the national level. And I bring this up because he, at this point, he's known, again, is he worthy of a book? There were three portraits hanging in the chambers. The meeting was in Chicago, so we're the host town, we're the host state. And there were three portraits hanging on the wall at the uh, founding meeting. There was Frederick Douglass, obviously a legend with the civil rights movement. T. Thomas Fortune, who was a leading civil rights person at the time and the person who called the convention. And John W. E. Thomas. So he was somebody. He was worthy of a book, as I like to say. Um, in 1892, he was selected to be the first African American to run for uh, presidential elector in Illinois. It was actually kind of a consolation prize. He had wanted to run for delegate um, and didn't get it, um, and he was the first there. And after that, he kind of left politics. He moved. He had always lived by Dearborn Station, where that is now. And in 1893, he moved to 3308 South Indiana. It was an all-white neighborhood that eventually became pretty much the buckle of the black belt. Um, <clears throat> but he, his was the first African-American um, household on that, on that block. And in 1899, he passed away. And when he passed away, he'd been a successful attorney. He'd also been in real estate, and he was thought to be the, the wealthiest man in the city, the wealthiest African-American in the city of Chicago. Um, his legacy is um, certainly the Civil Rights Act, certainly the, uh, the first uh, African-American in the legislature, and also the people that he kind of went on after him. A lot of them were his allies and political friends. Edward Morris, who's, who's a large name in the whole Du Bois-Washington fight, was a John Thomas ally. Edward Wright, who became the first uh, black committeeman in the city of Chicago in the 1920s, cut his teeth working for Thomas. Um, so he had a legacy in that way. So he always knew, again, one of the, one of the uh, criteria I asked as I went through this for 14 years was is he worthy? Is he worthy? Did did he know? Was he, and did he know that he was the first? Did he face any undue pressure? And was he always made aware of it? Yes, he was always made aware um, that he was the first African American in the legislature. People treated him different. He had to act different. Um, I'd like to end now with, with this section, just kind of letting you know a little bit of the pressure that he was kind of under at the time. Um, this was uh, when he sought re-election in 1878. Okay, he'd finished his first term and he was seeking re-election. And this is what he wrote in his re-election. Back then, you'd, your re-elections, you didn't have TV commercials. That was obviously after 1950, except at the Presidential uh, <laughs> Museum here, where they have a couple from 1860. Um, but you, you didn't have TV commercials. You really didn't have pamphlets. You just put a notice in the newspaper. So this was his notice, talking about his first term. And, he go, and I, like to, I always like to end with this, because I like to think this gives you a feel for the man, um, for who he was. And, and for the pressures that he, that he kind of faced. So he wrote, deeply impressed by the duties of my new position, surrounded by friends who were anxious and fearful should I not well discharge those duties, and by open enemies who would watch my course in order to criticize and find justification for the oft-repeated assertion that colored men are not qualified for official position, I conscientiously endeavored by diligent study and earnest thought to prepare myself intelligently and satisfactorily to discharge my duty as a legislator. 
I may have erred on some occasions, who has not? This I have, however, the proud satisfaction of knowing. No taint of personal or political dishonesty was ever or can ever truthfully be charged upon me. I was true to myself, true to my state, and true to my party. And I believe that no member of the legislature, of which I was a member, can be found, be he Republican or Democrat, whom will not say that I have today his respect as a legislator and his esteem as a man. So that's the thought process that was going on in his head. So when I asked the question, was he aware? Yeah, he was aware. And with that, um, I, I'm going to take a moment and talk about the community just real quick. I, I like to end on that, and I said I was going to end on that, and I lied. So you caught me in my first lie. Um, one of the things I do like about this book, as I'm writing about Thomas, and again, deciding this guy is worthy, not a lot had been done about the African-American community in Chicago either, and it is fascinating. And some of the characters I met, they still are around today, not the character, not the people themselves, but as someone who's been involved in politics a little bit, I see these people all the time in different, different aspects. Uh, one of them was Ferdinand Barnett. He was a proud patrician. Found he was a lawyer, married to Ida B. Wells, um, very intelligent, very proud, um, founder of the first African-American newspaper in the city of Chicago, and him and Thomas tussled. He would have been a mugwump wanting to have the party leave the par have uh, the African-American community seek a little more independence from the Republican Party. He eventually came back and him and Thomas reconciled. Um, but a very proud pat patrician um, who I find just fascinating. Um, never won an election, by the way. Um, there's Lloyd Wheeler, the wealthiest African-American in Chicago early on. Um, who I like a lot because he was a Democrat and was committed as a Democrat, not because of race issues, but because he opposed uh, the gold standard. He, he, he liked free silver, and he was consistent, so I like him. Um, you have those among the elites. You have a guy named John G. Jones, who is sometimes remembered a little more than most. His nickname is Indignation Jones. Whenever he felt the community was slighted, and he always felt the community was slighted, he'd have an indignation rally, he'd just an impromptu rally complaining about this, that, or the other thing. He even, Daniel Hale Williams, performed the first open heart surgery, leading African American, founded Provident Hospital, a nursing school and hospital for African Americans, and John G. Jones, I give him credit, felt they were self-segregating, and he conducted an indignation rally. Uh, very few people attended that, by the way. Um, but that was John G. Jones, so he's interesting. A couple of more of the minor lights. I was asked, some of you saw the story uh, by Bernie Schoenberg. He mentioned to me, he goes, you know, at all these meetings, you mention all these names. He goes, and it's a lot of names. And I was like, well, I don't want these people to be forgotten. Uh, it's so important for him. And there's a couple of, I, I don't want to call them lesser lights, but there's John Howard, owned a cigar shop, wanted to be in politics. Whenever an election came up, he'd cozy up to John Thomas, and then Thomas would run and he'd go the other way. But always wanted to be in the legislature, never ran, but insisted on being called senator anyway. you got to like a guy like that. Or my favorite, and I'll end with this one, is a guy named Ike Rivers. And he was, not, he was what we call a political enforcer. He was the guy at the polls making sure, and things were a little more violent back then. He's the guy who today you'd have knock down yard signs and things like that. Back, back then it was a little, little more violent. He was involved in two shootings at the polls. Luckily he was only shot once. The other time he was the shooter. And my favorite story about Ike Rivers, and it was too good not to put in this book on John Thomas, was uh, he got into a fight with a Democratic alderman and in the fight bit off the alderman's lip. Now, I have, not, I have not been in a lot of fights, but that's got to be one heck of a fight. So the book is about Thomas um, and about his legacy, and I think he's worthy, but it talks about the community a lot, too, which I don't want ever to be forgotten. You have some, some great people. You have some pretenders in there. In my mind, that's a word I'll use. Um, and I would certainly qualify John Thomas as one of the greats back then. So I'm more than happy to – first of all, I'd, actually, I do want to thank the – Lincoln Presidential Museum and Library for hosting this. Um, I really do appreciate it. I lived here across the street at the library for most of the last 14 years doing the research. I see a lot of my friends here from the library, people who helped me get started. I do want to thank Eileen and Catherine, and Sabrina's probably around somewhere. I know she's been helping. Um, and then I'm not going to mention any more names because I'd probably miss somebody in these lights, but you guys know how much, uh, <laughs> how much you mean to me. So I'll open it up to questions.